Okay, welcome to Pay It Forward. Today I have a brand new memory bear pattern for you all. Uh, you all are familiar with my original memory bear and it, it has been such a huge success, that pattern. And so many of you taken, have taken a hold of that and ran with it. And there are some of my beautiful followers out there who have even made their own business, their own cottage industry out of creating memory bears for sale. So I thought it was time we added another option to the series. And I think you're going to love this one. So while my original memory bear is a very modern style, great for um, taking in people's memory clothes and creating a fantastic bear. And he's also a great size, so check him out. This one is more of a vintage original uh, style bear, a very German shape. And it, it will be lovely for you all to offer a second alternative to your customers. So we've got what is probably just, like I said, a more classic traditional style, very German in the head shape. And I've made this one up just in a pure wool blend upholstery fabric. So all of those coats that you've put aside and all of those upcycled upholstery fabrics that you have and you've been waiting for the perfect pattern, this one is definitely it. I also show you some simple embroidery techniques to bring it all together. And this bear is made for embellishing. So lovely open limbs that you can, lots of space to add embroidery and all sorts of little bits and pieces that people give you when they want you to create a memory keepsake. So this one is designed specifically to not use fur. So I want you to keep that in mind. When you take a fur bear pattern and you try and make it up in fabric with no pile, what you'll have is a very unattractive bear where all the proportions are wrong and, and your bear will look very starved. So bears made in fabric have to be specifically designed so that all the joints are correct, the proportions are right. So your bear still looks plump and filled out, but without any fur. So remember that. So you can use any no, no pile fabric with this one. You can, my masterclass people may be going, oh, I want to make that in mohair. You certainly can, but keep it to an absolute almost no pile mohair. So the antique felted mohairs would be beautiful made up in this, uh, with this pattern. So go ahead and do that. Now I've got your free pattern all ready for you. It is in the description box below. You'll see underneath the video here, it will say, see more. Click on that, that will open up that uh, box further and you'll see the link to your free pattern. You can print your pattern templates out on your own home printer. You will need to use A4 paper like we have in Australia. It is uh, specifically designed to be printed on A4 paper, this pattern. So make sure you get that. Also set your printer to printed actual size and you should be right. Use the measuring bar that is on every one of your pattern template pages to make sure that you're getting that right. Also, I include all of my seam allowances within my pattern, so you just cut on the line. So who's ready to make my brand new memory bear? So let's have a look at what we're going to need to make this beautiful bear. What I'm going to show you first is the fabric that I'm going to be using. So I'm basically calling this my little upholstery bear because it, 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 I think it's time we had a bear that will use all of your heavier weight fabrics. And it is designed specifically for this. So what I've got here, it's a wool blend fabric and you can see that it's quite thick. It's very much like a felt, it's a felted wool by the looks of things. I did purchase it from overseas online and I was very happy with it. I have interfaced that, of course. Now it doesn't matter how heavyweight your fabric is, you still need to interface it with your fusible woven cotton interfacing because that, that stabilizes it and it stops your fraying and stretching. So often when you're working with upholstery fabrics, the weave can be quite open and it is beautiful to make these bears up in a, more of an open weave linen. Um, however, you need that interfacing on the back to stabilize it all and stop that major fraying. We also treat our openings 
with a stay stitch first, which I will show you as we go along. So this is my choice. You can use any kind of a wool blend. You can use a heavier weight canvas. Anything that is a stronger fabric, anything that has a bit of a, a, a plushy feel to it, a little bit of a thickness, will work beautifully. And this bear can also be made up in pure felt. Just make it up in straight felt. It will make up beautifully. To all of my masterclass people, any of you looking for a mohair bear pattern, this pattern will make up um, stunning in a absolutely short, felted, sparse mohair, but no pile, something really, really flat and sparse and it will make up beautifully. Don't go ahead, make this bear up in a pile because it will completely change the whole dimensions of the bear and it just won't look right. So that's my fabric. So we are going to start with our body pieces. Now this bear is great um, for embellishment. So, and it's one of the reasons why I've chosen to do this design. It's a bear that can be used largely for memory bears because you can add so much to this pattern and you, you've got that beautiful strong base of the upholstery fabric that will allow you to do all sorts of embellishments. Now, I'm working with a three colorway throughout this bear, keeping it all beautiful and soft and tonal. So my three colors are predominantly the blue, the cream, and my third colour, which should all, there should always be a third colour, even if it's just a tiny little pop of that. And it's very subtle and it's like a very soft beige. So, but two colours on their own, it tends to need a bit of a lift. Always bring in a third colour, even when you're going for a tonal look. So you can see there I've got my two side body pieces. They are interfaced, as I said. And I've already done the work on one of those side belly pieces. I've given you that heart shape. But of course, you can make your bear completely plain or you can embellish it, embellish it in your way. But I just thought I'd give you a basic look at a, an embroidered bear. We're going to be doing a very simple lazy daisy stitch, which I will show you how to do if you want to use that. So we also have our body back pieces and you'll notice when I said about that stay stitching, we've already done that on those pieces, um, which I'll talk more about in a minute. So those are our body pieces. We can put those aside. Let's move on to our leg pieces. So I'm going for an, an embroidered, darned sort of looking bear here. And again, the beauty of this project is the majority of your embroidery is done before you put the bear together. So you can see there on the outer leg pieces, I've added those gorgeous details and a bit of lace, everything's still in those tones. I don't worry too much about putting anything on the inside of the leg, which is the one that has the joint spot um, because you really don't see much of that. I've added a little bit on the opposite side, but just minimal, just a little uh, around the ankle there. On this one, just some pearl beads, some matching buttons, a bit of lace and that lazy daisy stitch again. Also remember that they have to be interfaced with that same fusible woven interfacing. So the foot pads that go in those feet, this is an opportunity too to create something really amazing. And in memory bears, of course, you could embroider names, dates and so on. So you can really personalize this project. I just added a few little trims on one of the foot pads and throughout, if you're doing a bear like this, keep it all random. Don't make everything all matchy matchy. Um, it's way more pleasing to the eye if it's all quite random. So with the second one, the second foot pad, I want to create the look of a, there was a hole in her toe and that somebody has darned it and fixed it up and we're going to be adding a little flower in there. I'll show you I've done it with the paw pad. Um, so what we've got there, the paw pads in general are just, I'm using pure wool felt, again interfaced, then I've done my embellishment on them. With this one, I've got a base, an interfaced base of that lovely cream linen and then I have my top piece cut from felt with my fusible webbing applied. So I can fuse that into place on top and we can do some stitching around here and add our little flower, which I will show you with the arms. 
which we've got here. So with the arms again, I've already done my embellishment stitching. So on one of them, I've gone just a little filigree sort of look down the arm. Again, buttons, that lazy daisy stitch. No, nothing on the inner arm. And then the paw pad is what I was talking about here. So you see, I've created the paw pad. I've given you that template that allows you to do that cut out. And isn't that just so pretty? It looks like someone's gone ahead and darned the little hole, made it a little hole pretty with a flower. So very, very sweet, still in keeping with all of those colors. With this one, I'm leaving the paw pad plain and I'm going to be sewing a blanket applique stitch around the paw when it's all stuffed. That's a technique I haven't shown you yet and I think you're going to love it. It's very easy to do and quite striking on your finished bear. Again, a little posy of flowers, some buttons, a little wristlet there. That's all we need there. So those are the arm pieces so you can see how everything's going to blend beautifully. Then we move on to the head. So with the head pieces, again, I've already done some work on the front center headpiece. You can see there with my lazy daisy stitches there. So we've got two side headpieces in the blue and those are interfaced. And then the center head gusset on this one, what I wanted was a beautiful domed head. When you're working with fabric with no pile, the curves on the bear are really important. Everything needs to be smooth and flowing and the design is so, so important. This bear has a beautiful head and it's got a lovely dome at the top which rounds it out. So we've got those two pieces. But what I've done is I've gone ahead and added some embellishment before we even put that together. So then we need ears. The ears are also interfaced and I've just got my four pairs. I don't do a lot to the ears. I like the ears to stay quite plain and it really keeps them looking lovely and rounded and cupped. So interface those ears. Then we look at our joints that we're going to need. So we need a neck joint, which is 50 millimeters. We've got two leg joints, which are also 50 millimeters. And then we've got our two arm joints, which are 40 millimeters, and you do need to joint this bear. Throughout, I have used a series of pearl threads. I use eight ply. A couple of times I moved up to a five ply for some thicker flowers, but on the whole, I think eight ply pearl thread works best. If you're used to doing embroidery, you'll have all sorts of threads and things that you can use. That's just what I used. You will need a pearl thread in a color to suit sewing your nose and mouth. Speaking of the nose, I'm going to be sewing a full nose um, and I'll show you how to do that. I have a template that you can cut out and I cut a little scrap of leather. Leather works best for a nose template because it holds itself well. And I'm going to be stitching my nose in black. That's going to be the nice contrast with all these soft colors. I'm gonna have a lovely dark eye and that black nose and mouth. Um, you can, I will show you how to sew a nose. You can do a little vintage nose, which is just a few strands over the nose. If you're concerned about sewing a perfect nose, that's a way around it. Um, we will be needing eyes, of course. Now, lots of options for eyes. I could be very tempted to go for a beautiful blue, but I'm not. I'm gonna stay classic. And the size, you can use a 14 millimeter eye on this bear or a 16 millimeter eye. The larger the eye, the younger and sweeter the bear's face looks in this particular design. So if you go down to a 12 millimeter eye, it will still look good, but it won't look as sweet. It won't look as soft. It'll look, definitely will look more German, um, more of a harsh look. I'm gonna go for a 14 or a 16 millimeter. I've got dark eyes there, full black and pupiled, but I'm gonna keep it quite dark. So you will also need some polyester filling. You will need extra strong thread to sew your bear throughout and of course your polyester thread in your machine. So a heat erasable marker will be handy. 
when I show you that lazy daisy stitch and a couple of tiny discs that you can trace around, I'll show you the simplest way to sew a lazy daisy stitch. Um, and that's about it. That's all we need. We, do, we will need some clear craft glue um, and your general sewing requirements. If you have a wool felting needle, that's going to be really handy with your stuffing. So let's get started on making the body. So we are going to begin on making the body of our bear, but first I want to show you the little lazy daisy stitch that I've used throughout. Just in case you want to use that one, it's a simple stitch, most of us know how to do it, but in case you don't and you want to incorporate this into any of your designs, um, this is how you do it. So I'm gonna do it on a little scrap here. And what I have is a single strand of pearl thread. I'm using eight ply, it's nice and fine. And I prefer to use pearl thread for embroidery like this, particularly on a bear, because it's a single strand. And with embroidery floss, you can get that separating of the stands, which are strands which I really don't like. Um, so that's why I use that. I'm just using a purple to give you a good contrast color. Now, the first thing I do, now certainly, most people don't do this, but I think it makes it so much easier. I've taken a heat erasable marker and my little circle disc, whichever size you want your flowers to be. And I've used two throughout this bear. So my 16 millimeter and my 20 millimeter disc. I've traced around it and made that very clear mark in the center. I have a single strand and I have a knot in the end, just one simple knot in the end. We're going to start by coming up from the underneath right in that center mark. And then we're going to take our thread straight out and hold that there with my thumb. I'm gonna go back into basically the same hole where I started and I'm gonna bring my needle out right on that line that I've created. And I'm bringing my needle out through the thread loop. I'm gonna use my thumb to hold that there and I'm creating that first stitch. So it's a double stitch that has that little look of a petal on the end. So we're just going to now dive back in and anchor the top of that petal. That's all there is to it. So then our next stitch, rotate your work as you go our next stitch, we come up from the circle again and we're going to do the same thing. You want to dive back in, right back in almost the same hole and decide how far apart do you want your little petals. You can make it a tight full flower, you can make it quite sparse like a daisy, whatever you like. So, but each time I'm bringing my thread out through the loop. You see again, there's my second petal. And again, just anchoring that little end of that petal into place. Very, very important when you're doing these that you rotate your work. If you don't, you'll end up with, your, your, it'll be like a little whirl rather than all coming straight out. So again, I've come up from the center taking my stitch straight out and again having that circle marked out on the outside means you get really a perfect little balanced flower shape. Don't pull those stitches too tight because then you'll lose the look of that separated petal. Anchor that one down and you just continue on. I'm gonna continue on and finish and be aware as you're going to be watching your placement for how you finish off. You want to be able to finish off keeping everything even. It doesn't always work that way. And remember it is a flower. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but certainly look to be placing your stitches in a way where you end up with the right space at the end. So this is how my little flower turned out. Absolutely beautiful and even. And I've taken that to my iron and you can see I've just pressed away those marks. So that's absolutely the quickest and easiest way I think to get a perfect little balanced lazy daisy. Now, of course you can add a little bead in the center if you like, 
and like I've done here on this other little scrap here you can see that you can just use the same technique to make little leaves use your stab back stitch for your straight sections and you can create little flowers super super easy so just like I have here on our front body pieces now you can go throughout your project and do your embroidery on the outside of your of the pieces before we put it together which is what I've done we can also add a little once the bear is all put together but remember wherever you're adding some embroidery you need to remember to check where your legs are going to be what's going to be covered what isn't um, and what's going to be visible and what isn't so I've given you this little heart shape and I've just done two little flowers and made the little stalks and leaves um, but be careful to always remember don't put anything too close to the seam lines um, otherwise that's going to interfere with your embroidery to so keep it all nice and central whether it's on an arm so we've got like here with the arm I've kept everything nice and central and also remember on your body parts that they will curve around so you'll lose some of that around here so keep it central and you should be fine I'll show you mine as we go through so what we're going to do now is we're going to start working on our body the very first thing that you need to do with your body pieces and indeed all of your openings throughout is to sew a close zigzag satin stitch between the openings the marks of your openings it's going to stop your fabric from fraying stretching and when you go to close that opening at the end you're going to find it so much easier so we are going to take first of all we'll take our back pieces so this is our back opening we are going to pin and overcast from the neck edge to the first mark there make sure that you back and forth on your start and finish particularly at your opening and same here down to the base I sew all of my seams two times so it's a four millimeter seam allowance keep to that seam allowance because it will dramatically change your bear if you take a, a, a larger seam allowance you'll have a skinny looking bear so so one row of stitching one right on top of the other so that's for your back section and I always overcast everything everything that I sew I overcast it first do the same here this is our front so this is our body front here with our little belly at the front and my heart's already done I'm going to do the same thing overcast and stitch that seam two times so I've gone ahead and turned those both those pieces through and rolled out those seams super important as you go along with all of your makes that you roll out those seams and here's where you get to see the beauty of using a heavier weight fabric in this bear beautiful rounded seams so now we're going to turn those back the other way and we're going to sew the front body to the back body we are going to meet those points now I did take just some of my overcasting stitch out there so that I can open those two seams out nice and flat and I'll be able to get a pin straight through the center there and do make sure that you line up those two seams perfectly pin should go straight through there and then you'll find that your side pieces will just line up I tend to go from side to side just to make sure that I'm getting it even and that will meet up is that in right to the top so once we've done that I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to overcast all the way around and then sew that seam allowance of four millimeters again two times do make sure that you back and forth over that base seam and also at the top edge of each and so of course two times as I said four millimeter seam allowance all the way through 
So that has my body all stitched together. Now before we turn this one through, you want to go around and add your holes with your awl at your joint spots for the legs and for the arms on both sides. Then I've taken a doubled strand of extra strong thread on my needle and I've just gone ahead and sewn just a running stitch all the way around the neck edge starting from the back all the way around just about four to five millimeters in from the edge and then left my tail ends hanging so that I can now pull in that neck before we turn it through. It just gives you a neater finish. Now depending on how thick your fabric is will be how far you can pull it in. You want to get that pulled in as snug and tight as you can just enough so that it can allow the bolt of the head to slip through. So I'll get that as tight as I can and then I will knot that off at least four times before snipping my thread ends. You can go ahead and turn that body through and certainly go ahead and roll out all of those remaining seams. And so we've got that beautiful little, little football shaped body. That's all done, ready to go with that neck pulled in perfectly just enough to fit that bolt through. So we can put that one aside. We're gonna go ahead now and we're gonna start on the arms. So let's get started on these arms. We have our, two, there are three arm pieces. We have the outer arm, the inside arm and the paw pad. We need to add the paw pad to the inner arm. That's our first step. Have a look again at what I've got here, finished arm. So you can see, and this one, I kept all of that embroidery work right down the center of the outer arm because it will be seen. The inside arm, I don't put any embroidery. It's really not visible. And I have added to the paw pad that cute little flower with like that little hole effect with the linen underneath. I will show you how to do that one when we do the foot pad. For now, on this particular arm, what I'm going to be doing is just adding a plain felt, interfaced felt pad, paw pad to the inner arm. And then I'm going to be sewing a blanket applique stitch around the outer edge and that will be its detailing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put right sides together of that paw pad and that arm piece. And I'm simply going to overcast and then sew that seam, which is a four millimeter seam allowance again, I'm going to sew that two times. So once you have that seam stitched, you want to go ahead and you want to roll out that seam as we have with all of the others. And you want to push that seam upwards. So the paw pad pushes the seam upwards towards the top of the arm. Now we're going to put right sides together of our two arm pieces, turn that over. This is really important. When you're working on the arms, when you're making any soft sculpture animal, you want to do all of your work, meaning your pinning, clipping, overcasting, and your stitching on the outer arm. The reason for doing that is if you do that the same on each arm, you, both of the arms will turn in a more balanced way. They'll be, they'll be the same. You won't have one arm turning out. A lot of people put together a bear and they don't understand why one arm is turning out and one is turning in. And it can really affect the finished look of your bear. This is an absolute game changer when you're making bears. So do all of your work from, as I said, from pinning right through overcasting and stitching on the outer arm. And when you do the second arm, you do exactly the same thing. We call it mirror sewing. So now what you're gonna see when this one's put together, if you put it together correctly and fill it nicely, what you'll get is a beautiful straight arm with a tiny little bit of a kick out of that paw at the end. The little paw will just turn out slightly. It's all in the design the way that I've shaped the arm. So you don't have to worry about anything except for following just those mirror sewing rules and you will get that lovely effect. So I'm simply going to clip this one right the way around into place. Make sure everything is beautifully lined up. And then I'm going to do my usual overcasting and my sewing. This is the section we leave open for turning 
So I will start here and I will overcast right the way around to the bottom and then I will stitch that seam two times, four millimetre seam allowance and make sure here particularly you go back and forth a few times because that's where we're going to turn it through and stuff it. Once you have sewn that seam, make sure that you go ahead and make the hole for that arm joint to go through. Now we can go ahead and turn this arm through and roll out all of those seams. We're now going to add the first part of our joint for the arm. We're going to do that using some clear craft glue. We, if you follow my jointing system, uh, you'll find this is super easy to do because we the way that I make up my own joints, I can add the joint now to the limb. I can close up that limb off the body and then be, still be able to attach it to the body and tighten those, uh, those joints up without uh, having to have uh, hanging on to the bolt on the other side. Uh, this is just much easier. So what I'm doing there is I'm just adding some clear graph glue to the underside of that disc and then I tend to use my forceps for this. I'm just going to slip that in and find that hole that we made before we turned it through and then I'm just going to push that fabric down around that bolt, make sure everything's nice and smooth. And then I like to go ahead and just temporarily add the other pieces to that joint because that helps press it down and hold it in place. And it also means that I don't have to wait for that glue to dry. I can go ahead and stuff that arm, which is exactly what I'm going to do now. So there's our beautiful finished arm. Remember that wrist section there with the little button makes a lovely, lovely little embellishment. So let's go ahead and start filling this arm. Now we're going to be, I'm going to be using my forceps. Let me grab some filling. So I'm using my longer forceps here. They're very handy and I'm going to be filling that paw pad first. So I start and this way I want to see the hand and I would like to support the end of that paw there and I'm getting that first bit of filling all the way down there really focusing on making that great shape at the end. Now filling is an art in itself you get better at it the more that you do and you certainly mustn't approach filling stuffing as in just filling up a hole you're actually sculpting a shape so as you do it. Now when you're filling an arm, ideally you would end up with an arm shape that is sort of an eclipse shape like this. You don't want a sausage. You don't want a round sausage arm. And you will definitely get a round sausage arm if you just randomly shovel that filling in there. You need to be thinking about keeping that arm flattened. So what we end up with is you see how that's sort of more of an eclipse shape rather than a, just a round sausage. We've got a lovely flattened out paw that's still absolutely rock firm. Now there's no give in this little arm at all. That's how firm you need to fill it. And it takes a bit of stuffing and you can take your time. It takes me a while as well and supporting that arm as you do so. So I fill this, I fill up to about here and then I take my wool felting needle and my 36 needle I use for stuffing and I can pack that filling in and it keeps it down there. Then I fill the top part of the shoulder, focus on filling a lovely rounded top shoulder and I fill the centre section in last and then fill right up almost to the edge and use my wool felting needle to tuck it all in. So I'm going to get that arm all ready to go, show you how that should look and then we'll come back and close that opening. So that has the arm all filled, beautifully firm from top to bottom right through that midsection. You can see there that I've taken my wool felting needle and I've just tucked everything in there nicely so it's not going to spring out at me while I'm closing that opening. And also make sure that if you've already made the other arm, you check that you have them balanced and you can see the turnout is exactly the same on that wrist. So we'll have a beautiful balanced bear. So 
What I'm going to do now is just close that opening. Let me see if I can get you a bit closer so you can see. Okay, so just a little bit closer there and we're going to go ahead and start sewing that opening closed. So I have a strand of extra strong thread with a whole big pile of knots on the end there. We just don't want those to pull through. I'm gonna take my needle and I'm gonna go in underneath where that opening starts and right where that seam starts to open out, I'm gonna bring my needle out at that four millimeter seam allowance. Pull that through and that knot will hold. Then I'm going to take my thread straight across to the other side, exactly parallel, and then I'm going to travel down just the length of one stitch. Your stitches are usually around about four millimetres. You're working with heavier weight fabrics too with this bear. So I'm going to pull on that and already you can see that first little stitch is pulling those edges together. Then we're going to go back across to the other side and we're going to go back into that, that first hole that we started with. And we're gonna travel down one stitch, must keep them nice and even. And pull that one in. Give that a little squeeze and pull it in each time. It will slacken off, but that's okay. It's got memory. You definitely want to be pulling in every stitch. So now I'm gonna travel back across and I'm gonna go into the last exit hole again from the last stitch. Again, traveling down one stitch. And if I pull on that, squeeze that together, you can see that's going to close that opening well. I'm using a thread color. I'm lucky to have a thread color that matches exactly to my fabric, which works well. But if you don't have an exact match, when you're closing openings, general rule is you're better off with a slightly darker thread than a lighter thread. It will be more invisible. So you can see that that's pulling in beautifully. You wouldn't sew halfway down and then try and pull up all your threads because they won't knit in well together. So it really is just as simple as that. Take your time and do make sure that you're keeping those stitches nice and even so that you're closing it evenly. If you're taking stitches bigger on this side than this side, you're gonna end up with puckering at the bottom. So again, giving that a squeeze and pulling that in each time. Continue down until that opening is closed. You'll just cast off somewhere in the seam here and sink the knot. So that has that opening closed. That's how the, your closings should look nice and invisible. I do have a video on Pay It Forward here that shows you how to close an opening and it does use more contrasting colors. So you can check that out if you like. So now what I'm going to do is show you how I sew a blanket applique stitch around a paw pad. So that's something a little bit different and it's just something that you can do um, on any of your bears and it's a lovely finish. And you'll be surprised by using all sorts of different colors how that comes up. I'm going to start with a long strand of my pearl thread and I am using an eight ply, uh, still nice and fine. I'm using a contrasting color. I'm gonna get that little fly out the way. Right, and I'm going to first, I'm going to be starting at this corner. So I've got to dive into my fabric of the arm anywhere. It doesn't really matter. I've got a knot in the end and I'm gonna come out right at that starting point. So it's right on that seam line there. I pull that through. I just will encourage that little knot to sink into that fabric. Just by enlarging that hole a little, that should just pop in and then hold. I'm using my medium doll needle. I just find it a little bit easier doing this. So we are now going to take our first stitch. Our first stitch, you determine the length of the applique stitches you want. 
I'm going to make mine around about six millimetres. So I'm just going to dive in and bring my needle out right on that seam line edge. And I'm bringing my needle out through that thread loop there. Hope you can see that. Put my finger on there, move along just a little, staying with my seam allowance, with my seam being around about six millimetres. And I'm keeping this distance about six millimetres too. So it's like a little square. Again, bring my needle through that thread loop. Travel along. And what that's going to do is it's just going to create that nice little decorative edge. And the top binding section should sit right in your seam line. See how that's coming along? Just a lovely, simple way to frame up a paw pad. And I might do a couple of little darning stitches on the end of the paw as well, but I can certainly do that at the end. So there you can see, I hope you can see that. Lovely little finish, just continue on right the way around till you get to here. You can go across the wrist if you like, I just tend to do the lower edge. There we go, that completes that beautiful stitching around that paw pad. I think you'll agree, it's a lovely way to add a little bit more embellishment in a very simple way. And if you contrast the colors, you can make some amazing things, especially in the brights, the colorful brights. So I'm now going to move on to making the legs. So we have our two leg pieces here. I have a fully constructed leg to show you. This one is all done again focusing my embroidery on that midsection there, a little strip of lace across there. A couple of little pieces of lace on the inside leg. You really don't have to do much on the inside of the legs. And also that great foot pad with that detailing beautifully stitched into place. Again, packed very, very firm. Should have a beautiful straight leg. So I've got my second leg there. I've done that detailing again, kept it right in the center, little bit of diagonal lace across there. We are now going to put right sides together. And just as we did with the arms, for the same reason, we are going to mirror sew and we are going to do all of our work on the outer leg. So both those legs will turn in the same way and it will be beautifully balanced and you've seen how that works with the arms. So I'm now going to go ahead. We've got the opening here, which is an absolute bonus in this bear because it means that the part that's showing is all stitched on your machine. You get a beautiful curve here and your closing is done at the back. Your closing should be neat too, um, but it's much easier to do on the back there on that straight edge. So we are going to work on the outer leg, we're going to pin or clip, we're going to overcast from the heel up until that start of that opening there, remember to back and forth, same here, at the top opening we go all the way around down to the toe, we leave this section open and this section open, overcast and stitch that seam two times, same as all of the others with a four millimeter seam allowance. So you can see I have that leg all stitched up and I have gone ahead and just removed some of the tacking stitches, the overcasting stitches from the toe and the heel so that we can open out those seams nice and flat there for when we go to add the foot pad. Now I'm gonna show you how I made that little flower detail on the, like I've done on the hand and we're gonna put it on the foot pad. So you have your interfaced, piece of base fabric that's the piece the fabric that you want to show through that little hole and your felt is cut with your fusible webbing and we're just going to press that one into place directly over the top make sure everything is well lined up use a hot iron and a, and a protective cloth so that has that pressed into place. So now we've got one piece. I'm going to sew a blanket applique stitch around here. But I want to show you a little trick that I've used throughout and you can use in 
certain circumstances. Now, if you're working with pure wool felt, you can actually slightly age the felt with your iron, but you can only do that if you have a backing fabric behind it, because we don't want to be damaging that backing fabric. That's where we're going to be sewing through. We want everything still to be nice and strong. But if you have pure wool felt and you just let your iron lightly discolor or scorch the edges of your pore pads, and it can work with many colors, don't try and do this with anything synthetic, but pure wool just gives a lovely vintage sort of a discoloration to it. And you focus on the edges. You see, I've gone there through, I don't know how obvious it is there, might be able to see that. So I focused on the underside here and up the top here. On the pores, I've done up this area and around the front. Very, very subtle, but it's a way of discoloring it and aging it just slightly and it takes that starkness off it. Something you can try, please remember, only do that with a natural fibre, never try and do that with any kind of acrylic. So that one's nice and ready to go and I'm going to sew my blanket applique stitch around the outside edge of that little mark there. I haven't drawn my flower in yet because I'd rather just be concentrating on this. So I'm going to start, I've got a single strand of my eight ply pearl thread. I've got a knot in the end and I've just come up from the underneath right on the edge there. I'm going to take my needle in. I'm going to keep these stitches nice and small. So I'm going through all the layers, taking up some of that underside layer of that linen, that lovely textured linen, and I bring my needle out through the loop. That's my first stitch. Then we're gonna keep that nice and small and tight needle coming out through the loop each time. Make sure that you're rotating your work as you go. And it just gives a lovely little binding stitch. Of course, you can use any color that works for your project. I'm just going for that very pale blue. My flower that's on the inside will be the deeper blue. And it's just a great way to add a little bit more hand stitching. You could also do just a hand running stitch around the outside edge with your pearl thread. That looks really cute too. Gives it more of a darned sort of a look. And you can see, I'm just gonna make my way around that entire inside edge until I've got the same effect as I've got on this one. So there you can see, I have gone ahead, stitched that blanket applique, and then I've added my flower in the same way that we did when I showed you the sample, just with my heat erasable pen to make the circle, stitched that into place and added that bead. Of course, you could do anything you like with yours. So now we're going to add this foot pad to the leg and we are going to take our pin through the top mark at the four millimeter seam allowance. And we're going to go straight through that center toe seam, putting right sides together, of course. And you want to make sure it does go straight through the center, also at four millimeters. And then I like to put the heel in place the same way. If you've kept to your seam allowances, this foot pad will fit perfectly. straight through the back and then I will start to fit this in. It's a decent size foot pad so it's not too tricky to put in. And I just start to pin through all of the layers and then take up some on the opposite side push my pin head all the way down. It's pull it, putting in a foot pad and a, pinning in a foot pad in a three dimensional way. 
So your pin goes through all of the layers. You flip it over and take up just a little bit of fabric on the other side. Pin head goes all the way down. That clamps it into place, stops the pins coming out at you. Also helps when you're sewing the seam. You don't have those pin heads all sitting up. So I do the same at the heel, making sure that's beautifully centered. Foot pads are one of the most visible things, one of the first focal points on your bear. So it's important to take your time with them and get them right. You can see, pin through, clamp that down. You can see that foot pad is going to fit in perfectly. So I'm going to continue with my pins all the way around and then I'm going to overcast that foot pad into place with a tacking stitch and remove all my pins. So you can see there that I've overcast that foot pad into place. Now I'm going to take a single strand of extra strong thread. Make sure you're using an extra strong thread, an upholstery thread, a knot in the end, and we're going to actually sew the seam. Because this is quite a squarish uh, foot pad on the sides, we only have to hand sew in the top curve and the lower curve and then we can connect up with our machine sewing on the sides. So that just saves a little bit of time. Now, if you're unsure of thread color, your foot pads will always be, the stitching of, on your foot pads will always be less visible if you match your thread color to the foot, not the foot pad. Even though we're putting in a cream foot pad into a blue bear, the, the stitching will be less visible if I use a blue. So that's just a general rule that will help you throughout because when we're making bears, the foot pads are often, often a completely different color to the project itself. So hopefully that helps you out. So we're gonna start, it is a four millimeter seam allowance and we're gonna come in from the underneath and just do, first of all, two stitches right on top of each other. So this is a stab back stitch. It's how we sew all of our foot pads in and how we do any hand sewing seams on our bears. It's the strongest stitch of all, especially because we use that upholstery thread. Then I'm gonna travel along on the underneath, bringing my needle up the length of a stitch, keep them nice and small and even, and back in to the last exit hole so that the stitch will be linked. Make sure you're pulling that nice and tight each time and then move along a little further, following the shape of the foot pad. Remember what I said about it being such a focal point of your bear. Back into that last exit hole each time. Again, through and back. So the stitch is completely linked front and back which makes it so super strong. I'm gonna go right round to here, then I'm gonna leave this open and do the base. When you come to the center point here, I always do two stitches either side of that center point so that is really locked into place. And once I've done that, I've got those both stitched, I can take it to the machine and I can easily link up the sewing. When you do your machine sewing, make sure that you do two rows of machine stitching. So there you see, I've turned that leg through now that everything is sewn up. Check that your foot pad, we've got a beautifully rounded foot pad there and I've rolled out all of those seams. Now from here, you remember what we did with the arm where we added the glue to the inside of that disc, slip that up through that hole there that we've made um, at the joint spot, glue that into place and add the other parts to our limb, just like this one, done it with the other leg here, tighten that up, and then you can go ahead and stuff the limb. So you want an absolutely rock solid foot here, nice and solid all the way through, right up and to around that joint. Again, you will want to make sure that you've got this section um, tucked in with your wool felting needle, 
so that you can close that opening, just close that opening exactly the same way as we did with the arm. Before we start the actual head, we're going to sew the ears. The ears are really simple. Now, often I will put um, a little bit of glue between the layers of the ears inside and seal them together so that we get a really nice cupped shape. But in the case of this bear, I want you to remember that because we're using an, a, a heavyweight upholstery fabric, we want everything to be nicely rounded. And if we don't do that gluing together in this one, and we pull that ear around, give it a lovely cup shape, we get a certain amount of volume in the ear and it looks really nice. So this time, all I need to do is put right sides together. I'm just going to use a clip there. I've given you a mark at the top that helps you line up those ears perfectly. And we're just going to sew on your pattern pieces, you'll have marks. I'll actually just put them in here that show you where to start your sewing. And what I'm going to do is sew an overcasting stitch from this mark to the corner all the way around back to this mark. This section we leave open. If we sew this lower section just a little bit, it helps us turn the corners through, makes them much easier to push through. Then we just close this opening. So I am going to go ahead and do that. Then I'm going to sew that very small four millimeter seam allowance and make sure you really go back and forth on your start and finish here and double stitch your corners. You don't have to sew the ear twice because it doesn't have any filling, uh, but you do need to reinforce those points. Go ahead and turn that ear through. And again, make sure you really push out those corners and roll out those seams. And I'm simply now going to take a, just a strand of my extra strong thread with a knot in the end. And I'm just going to tuck those edges in. Depending on the thickness of the fabric that you're using, it will be different with each one. I'm gonna pinch that together. And I'm actually just going to do a simple overcasting stitch on the base. Remember that this is exactly where we sew the ear to the head. So none of this will be seen. So just tucking in all of those fibers and making a nice, neat closing all the way across, just like I have here. So with ears all done, we can now move on to actually making the head. Now, let me first show you where I've done my embroidery on the head pieces. So you've got your center head gusset. This is the nose, goes down on the top of the nose. This is across the top of the head. That's the back gusset. I don't do anything there. But just across the forehead here, I've added a few of the Lazy Daisy flowers, a couple of beads, and making sure not to interfere with this area here. Around about here is where the eyes will go. And I've kept away from the seam lines. And I've also kept it random. I haven't made it all matched up. And at the side, the head goes in at the side here, I've carried that design down that will flow over onto the side of the head. So again, I've kept away from the seam line and I've kept away from this eye area added a few beads and some more flowers. So remember that you can make up this bear completely plain. Um, this is just to show you where to put that detailing if you're going to be doing that. So now, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to take those two side head pieces. We're going to put right sides together. Now it's very important to watch your sewing here and keeping everything lined up. This is the head of your bear and you want it to be as perfect as you can make it. And so I will be overcasting from the tip of the nose down to the neck edge. Then I will sew that seam. Again, it's a four millimeter seam allowance two times and make sure you go back and forth on your start and finish. Go ahead and turn that through once you have that stitched and really roll out that seam. You want to check that you've got a beautiful curve there. And also another tip, every single bear I make, I always remove the overcasting stitch after I've sewn the seam twice so that I can flatten out 
that seam and it really makes a difference to how straight that seam sits on the chin line. And this is a focal part of your bear. So these little tiny things that I do, that's what gives it that perfect finish. So we can just pop that aside. We're gonna quickly put the head gusset together, which is just as simple as right sides together. And we are going to line up across the top there. You've got your center mark to be able to match that up. Throw a clip or a pin in there. And again, we're going to overcast that seam there and we're going to then sew that seam four millimeter seam allowance two times again making sure you back and forth on your start and finish and again with this seam i always remove my tacking stitch my overcasting stitch and again flatten out that seam pop that through and you should get a beautiful rounded finish which will be across the top of that head rolling that out again and we've got that gorgeous curve. So now we are going to add that gusset to our side head pieces. So right sides together, we've got our center mark there at the front of the muzzle. We're gonna take a pin through the seam allowance, the four millimeter seam allowance, and we're gonna take that pin straight through that center front seam of the nose there. It's similar to pinning in a foot pad. Very important that you get it anchored in the center and then you'll just put your second pin just across the front of that nose there. Again, we're going to pin through all the layers, flip it over and push that pin head all the way down. At each time, make sure you've centered that. Let's push right down pin through all the layers. And what we're looking to do is match up your two marks. Now, if you followed your seam allowances, this will match up perfectly. This mark here with the mark on the head. Also, the most important thing to remember here is that we're only pinning and sewing in the front section of the muzzle here. We sew the back of the head separately. That gives you a way more accurate result. So again, I'm matching up my points. And you'll also notice that I'm working, I'm doing all of this work on the head gusset. I'm not doing this from here. You'd never do it from the side head panels. Always do all of your work putting in this head gusset actually on the head gusset. So you can see there how beautifully that fits all in together. Pop your pins all the way around. And you can see straight away that it's all nice and straight. So there we have that front gusset pinned into place. I'm now going to sew that same overcasting stitch all the way around from point mark to mark. And then we'll come, we'll come back and we will sew with a stab back stitch that section in by hand. With that front nose section now overcast into place, I've been able to remove all of my pins, which will make it much easier to sew that section. Now you wouldn't sew this on the machine because you will never get it accurate enough. So this is where we sew a stab back stitch. It's exactly the same stitch we used on the foot pad. So I'm gonna come up right there on the spot of that mark at my seam allowance. And as before, when we start a stab back stitch, I always do two stitches right on top of each other. And then we're just going to travel along. You have all the control with a stab back stitch to keep it all beautiful and straight. So travel along on the underneath and go back into that last exit hole. Keeping the stitches nice and even and pulling them in nice and taut each time. Especially if you're working with a very plushy sort of a thick fabric like I am. Just back 
into that last exit hole each time and you can see that I can create a beautiful straight line of stitching just as straight as if you were sewing it on the machine. So there we go. I'm going to make my way all the way around back to this point. I will finish off with two stitches on top of each other as we did at the start and either side of that front nose seam I'm going to do two stitches either side the same as we did with the foot pads. So let's get this one just the nose section stitched into place. Always go ahead and turn that nose section through to check that you've got everything absolutely straight and correct and that you've got a lovely beautiful front nose section. Roll those seams out while you still have access there. And this is why I always sew this section in first separately. It really makes all the difference. There you can see we've got a beautiful straight nose section. We can now pop that one back through and now we just have to put together those side head seams with the head gusset. I'm going to pin it in the same way as I did before and I'm going to follow that right the way around all the way down to the neck edge. Again you'll find that will all meet up beautifully if you have kept to your seam allowances. Notice also that I'm still working on the head gusset. I'm not pinning it from this side panel. Working from the head gusset I'm going to pin that down to the neck edge. I'm going to overcast it and then you can sew this section on the machine two times with that four millimeter seam allowance. Once you've done that you just repeat with the opposite side still working on the head gusset. I have gone ahead and turned that head through now and rolled out all of those seams. We've got our beautiful little lovely rounded teddy bear head shape. Now from here we'll go ahead and stuff the head but I want to let you know that if you want to be using safety eyes, so we were looking at the eye options at the beginning, I'm using professional teddy bear eyes which have a shank on the back, they're glass and we add them after the head is stuffed. The reason why we use them in this style is because we can pull in and get some lovely sculpting into that head by pulling the eyes in. But if you want to use a safety eye because perhaps you're making this for a child under three years of age, it's recommended that you use a safety eye. So a safety eye actually is put in before you stuff the head and you've got the little clamp on the back. Now here's my best advice. If you are using safety eyes, you never ever just guess where the eyes will be because the eye placement on a teddy bear is absolutely crucial to your overall, overall look in the end. And trust me, you will never ever get it right and even just by adding them now. So I've designed this particular pattern to suit safety eyes and the shank eyes. I've given it a really good pull in here so that the eyes will still look nicely sunk even if you're using a safety eye. But what you need to do is temporarily and quickly stuff the head just lightly to fill it out and then you want to mark in your points for the safety eyes then pull the stuffing out and add those safety eyes, clamp them down on the back. That way you know it's absolutely right. It might seem like a bit of wasted time but trust me it isn't. And also if you are using safety eyes I recommend you keep watching this video until you see me with the stuffed head adding the eyes, the shank eyes, so you can get the correct placement. So for now I'm going to go ahead and I am going to fill this head super super firm because we're going to be stitching a nose and it's much easier to stitch a beautiful nose if you have a really really firm packed teddy bear head and I've put in all these lovely curves for you so make sure that you fill them out. So the procedure for filling a head with your polyester filling is that you start with the nose section. So you take your filling and you add it into the front nose section. You pack it in nice and firm. 
The next section you start to fill out are these top forehead seams. And remember that on this one, we've got the domed head. So you want to be pushing the filling right up to the top. As you fill this head, fill it all the way around like this. Take your filling and be turning the head round and fill it till it's absolute capacity. And you'll find that you'll get some beautiful cheeks come out. If you just add filling to fill up a hole, you're not gonna get the correct shape. I'm going to get mine filled up until just a little way from the edge here. I'm going to use my wool felting needle as I go to keep it all packed in nice and tight. Then I'll come back and I'll show you exactly how that should look. So there I have that head all filled out. Absolutely rock solid. So no give anywhere in there. I've given, them, I've given my little bear some nice cheeks. This is all nice and firm, ready to have that nose stitching done and that top of the head nicely domed. So I have used my wool felting needle to flatten out that filling. And it's about a centimetre and a half from the edge there. Pack that all in, no give in that either. So now we take our first section of our joint with our longer bolt because it's the neck bolt. We're gonna slip that in there. And you can see that I've taken a doubled strand of extra strong thread. I've taken my medium short doll needle and I've sewn a running stitch all, around, all the way around the outside edge, starting at the back, left my tail ends hanging and it's about five millimeters in from the edge. All the way around, I've tied my first knot and now I'll be able to pull in those thread ends and you want to push that down and get that in as snug as you can. You probably won't get it right around that bolt, but it needs to be pulled in as tight as you can. You might need somebody to hold that knot for you as you do a double and then add perhaps another three or four knots. I will then go ahead with my needle and go around the second time and knot off again, just to make absolutely sure before I snip those thread ends. So there we go, that's how the bottom of your neck should look. The bear's neck pulled in, and you can see it doesn't go all the way to the bolt, but close enough considering your disc sits out to here. So now I've gone ahead and just temporarily pinned those ears into their approximate place. I will adjust that later. The ears are sewn on last when you're making a bear because you really need your bear put together sitting up in front of you to get them in the right position. So, and it's also easier to sew them on when you have more to hold on to. So for those of you using safety eyes, there's the placement for the eyes. It's actually just after that deep curve in, just slightly further along, but right on that seam line. Should just cover that seam line. 14 millimeter eyes, as I suggested, are about the best size. You can go down to a 12 millimeter. As I said, the bigger eyes just give your bear a softer look. Don't go too big um, for the same reason it distorts the whole dimensions of the bear. I'll be using 14 millimeter. So for now, I've just popped those eye pins in there to give me an idea of nose. I will stitch nose before I add eyes. If you're doing your safety eyes, of course, you've temporarily stuffed the head, get your eye placement marks in place, make those holes, unstuff the head and continue on, then pack your head nice and firm, just as I have, and you'll be up to this point. Okay, so my next step is to glue on the template for a nose. Now I'm stitching a full traditional nose. You don't have to do that, and in fact, these bears look beautiful with a nose that is a vintage style nose where you've just done a few stitches over it, in which case you don't, you don't need a template. So you can do a raggy kind of a looking nose intentionally and it just, it looks really amazing. This particular bear, I do want to do a full nose. I want it to, to be quite traditional. So I've given you a template for the best shaped nose for this bear. You can certainly change that up if you wish. I like that slightly squarish nose that just comes down at the base. I've cut my template from a little scrap of um, leather and it's going to just give me a base 
to work with that is really solid. If you use felt for a template, you'll find that you don't get the same result because you can, you really do have to pull hard on the nose stitches. And it does tend to crumple the template down and then you don't get that hold. So a nice solid piece of leather will do it really well. So I've just coated the back of my template in my clear craft glue, as you've seen, quite liberal. And now I'm going to add it to my little bear's muzzle, I'm trying to clean up those fingers there. And the placement is really important of where we put our nose template. So we want some to be sitting below that seam line and the majority of it to be folded over the top. So that's the placement. I hope you can get a good look at that. So it doesn't sit right up here and it doesn't sit below the seam line. You need to cover the seam line. So just about here, we're going to be making some stitches coming down and then the mouth will pull down from there. So once you've got it all lined up, go ahead with the palm of your hand and press that template into place. The clear craft glue dries very quickly, but you really want all of those edges adhered. Check it again, make sure you've got that, that in exactly the right position. And I just sit here and hold it for a while and make sure that it's really well adhered. Then I'm just going to leave that to dry completely, absolutely completely, before we start sewing any stitches because I don't want anything lifting up. So you can see it's taken on that shape of the end of the muzzle. You see the amount I've got below the seam line. That's the perfect spot for a really, really good nose. You might want to do a little oval shaped nose, which is fine. If you want to do that, go ahead and cut a little oval template and pop that on. But this is a traditional style and it's very easy to do. And it gives you a perfect mouth line too. You can also use a template, use a different colored top thread and give it a vintage look that way by not having all of the stitches perfect. You can actually space them and leave some holes intentionally. So that's another way to do a nose. So I'm gonna let that sit there and dry and we will come back ready with our pearl thread to stitch that. So I'm back and that nose template is completely dry. So I'm ready to stitch that over that nose with my pearl thread. I'm actually using a five ply for the nose because I just want that to be, have a little bit more volume. Um, on a smaller bear, you can use an eight ply. So I have a very long doubled strand of my pearl thread and I have threaded the two ends through my largest doll needle. And you thread it with the ends through rather than just one through to make a double thread because it allows you to remove your needle if you need to throughout the process. Otherwise you're stuck in there. If you have a wonky stitch, there's nothing you can do about it. So I have a knot in the end and as I said, my largest doll needle. So first of all, we need to work out how far down below that template we're gonna bring out, bring our lip line down. Now, you don't want to make it very long. You totally change the look of a bear by how long this top, what I call the top lip is. So if you want a sweeter looking bear, don't have that section too long. So I would say for me, it's about six to seven millimeters from the base of that template. And I'm going to be taking my needle and I want to bring it out. First of all, I'm just going to get it to where I, it's a good position. So I've just gone in at the base of the neck there and go back into that same hole. I want to bring my needle out right through that center seam at that six to seven millimeter point. So you can see that needle coming straight out through that center seam. And when you're sewing a nose, near enough is most definitely not good enough. You need to make sure 
that it is completely centered. Now that knot is going to hold down here. And now we're going to take those two threads. We're going to make sure they're not twisted and we're going to take them straight all the way up over the top of the nose. Very important that they're not twisted over. So you're following the seam line and finding the absolute center of that nose template. I'm going to hold that there with my thumb and I'm going to dive straight in at the top and I'm going to bring my needle out again right down to almost where we started. So I'm just going just a little way up from that first point that we began. Just about there. That's my needle coming out there. Pull that one through. Hold those stitches so that they stay nice and straight and that they're actually going in straight. And you want to pull on both of those stitches independently. Every single time. So now I'm going to pull that up. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to make sure you can see how that's pulled the template down a little. That's absolutely fine. Which is also why we need to use leather because it, it holds itself much better. So now I pull the second stitch up here. But before I do anything else, I'm just going to change my needle. I'm going to re-thread my needle onto a smaller, shorter doll needle. There we go. So now I'm going to dive in right next to that stitch at the top and I'm going to bring my needle out at the same place as this stitch across the other side. So it's just up a little bit. So there we go. That's got my second stitch into place. You can see it's perfectly even with the other one and I've come out at the bottom on the opposite side. Again, check that your threads are nice and straight, not twisting as they go in. And you can see that third stitch is going to go in the opposite side, the top of the template. And this time I'm going to dive my needle in at the top and I'm going to bring it out on the opposite side at the very start, of that lower edge of the template. So what we have is a nice little thick lip line. We're going to take a mouth line through that, but now we need to cover the rest of the template. So what I tend to do is I will go in at the top here and I will come out here and I will make sure that stitch is laid properly, pull on your threads. And then I will go back and forwards and I'll do a stitch each side, same as we just did, until that entire template is covered. So I'm going to do that, then I'm going to come back and show you what we do when we're adding our final stitch. Okay, so I hope you can see that there. A bit hard with the black, but I do need to stitch it in black. So I've just gone back and forth, placing my stitches, covering that template until it's all completely covered. I've gone right to the edge. I've kept everything even, same amount of stitches and across the top. I'm down here and I'm about to place my final stitch on this side. So this time I'm going to go in at the top of my template to match up on the other side and I'm going to bring my needle out to the corner of where you want the smile to be. Now a way to test that is I've just popped a little pin in there and you can actually, we're going to pull up into this midsection here. So you can see how wide you want your smile to be. You can adjust it up or down. You can make it longer. I'm just keeping it just a sweet little medium smile. It's going to tuck up like that and go match up on the other side. So where this pin is, that's where I'm going to bring my needle out. So I'm going to go in at the top of my template again. I'm going to place that final stitch very carefully 
once I pull it through, I'm going to find exactly that spot. and pull that all the way through. So I'm going to place that stitch. This is my most important final stitch. Again, making sure it's covering that template, that those threads aren't twisted. Hold it there, pull it in, and pull on both of those threads independently just to finish off that top line of that nose beautifully. And now we're going to take our needle and we're going to slip it in between those nose threads underneath. We're not taking any of that fabric, we're actually just slipping it behind the nose threads. Pull that through. Again, we've got to make sure that our threads aren't twisted and I'm going to place that mouth stitch. Give it some good tension. Pull it in. And then I just need to dive my needle in to match it up the same the opposite side. Keep that tension up. I'll take my needle down to the base here and I will cast off, still keeping that tension up, knot off a couple of times before I snip my thread ends. And that will be our beautiful little smiley bear. So you can see there that beautiful nose and smile. Now, if you have any issues with across the top of your nose, you want a perfect top to the nose, you can come in again, or you can, as you put in your last mouth stitch, you can come up on the corner and take one double stitch across the top of the nose. That's gonna give you that perfect line. But this is the nose shape we're looking for. It does take some practice stitching the perfect nose. Now I will be adding some nose gloss over the top of that one once we've completed the head. So now let's move on to doing a little tiny bit of shading. I'll show you how to do a bit of shading and we'll pop those eyes in. So before I add these eyes, I'm going to do a little bit of very soft shading. This is completely optional, but it really does give your little bear's face some real depth and soul. What I've chosen are some 14 millimeter glass eyes, premium glass eyes, and these are charcoal color. Once they're in the bear, they go a lot darker because it obviously, it's a colored glass, so it takes on the color that's behind. And I'm loving that sort of soft gray sort of a look, so that's, that's working well. But a clean black eye will look really good with this design as well. So similarly, will a nice dark brown glass eye with a pupil. Now we've chosen our spots. You can see where they are right on that inward curve. So I used my tester pins to try them out first. I'm happy with that placement. So I've gone ahead and made the holes with my awl, taken that all right in there. And you can see just how even those eyes are and do look at it from every angle. So now that I'm set on that, I can just pop those eyes aside for a minute. Now there's a couple of ways that we can do this shading. You can use your alcohol markers and you will need a colorless blender and a soft color. Now, obviously mine is a blue bear. I'm gonna go for a soft antique sort of a taupe color on the underside of the eyes and just to put a bit of color around the ears. You can use a warm grey. Um, a warm grey or a taupe is a good colour to use on nearly any coloured bear. But of course, you may have a cream coloured bear and then you have to lighten that off. So make sure that it's nice and soft. So you can use your Copic markers and you need a colourless blender to be able to really blend it out. It's all about absolute blending and softness with this technique. So my chosen product is an artist soft pastel. Of course, if I were working in masterclass, I would just airbrush it so I can softly airbrush it with anything I like. So my masterclass people, you can go ahead and do that. But artist soft pastels work really well. Now they are the chalky type. They're not the oil pastels. And I'm using a burnt umber, which is a very torpy sort of a brown. 
The way that I apply it is I take just a little card and I crumble some colour onto the card. I've got a very soft cosmetic brush. They're the best. They're fine and you can load the brush up. It's a bit like loading up some eyeshadow onto your brush. Now you want to have your eye there ready so you can test it and see where you're putting your colour. It's important that your colour goes behind the eye and on the lower edge of the eye. Don't put shading up here. It will look completely wrong. You need to shade under the eyes. So pull that eye out and I'm just going to pat that colour into place. This is a permanent colour. It's not something I would use on a bear that children are going to play with. But it is a permanent colour, as in the, the colour itself, the pigment, is permanent. But because it's a chalk, of course, that could spread onto hands if it was handled. So this is a collectible bear, so it's going to sit nicely on a shelf. But you see, I'm focusing most of my colour. I'm really punching it into that fabric. Then I'll take that eye and I'll have a little check. And you can see already, once we sink those eyes, it's just given that little bit of definition around the eye, but you can see just how subtle I've made that. So just match it up on the opposite side, just patting that in gently. There are other few key areas that you can shade. Now, particularly if you're looking to create a very vintage style little bear, who's well loved and worn. The other areas that you want to colour up are right on that chin. So below the lip line. So it's going to send that little mouth section back just a little. It's just the tiniest bit. And then just a little bit around the base of that nose. Just all around the edge, it just settles it in. And it, it doesn't look quite as stuck on. So just very gently does it. Again, just working that into that fabric Less is more here, everyone. You shouldn't see lines. It should just be a shadow. You can take a little across the top. And just blend that up a little. You can see the difference there. Now with the ears, the areas that I colour up, it's basically that seam line. As if he's been handled and he's got dirty little ears around the top. Again, really, really soft. You can also do this on the top side of the hands and the paws on the toes. With your embroidery, you could add claws to your bear. I've done a lot of embroidery on mine, so I won't be doing that, but this just colors it up. It's very, very subtle, probably hard to see. You'll see it in the end, in the final picture. So as, as much or as little as you want, but in general, Keeping it nice and soft is best. So now let's actually put those eyes in place. So with my shading all done, we're going to add these eyes. So I take a doubled strand of my extra strong thread, a nice long doubled strand. Then I'm going to fold it again in the middle to give myself four strands. I'm going to find the loop in the center and then I'm going to slip that through the shank of that eye. I'm gonna open up that loop and take all four ends through. And that's going to give me that eye nice and secure, a knot, 
with four strands of thread. So then we're just going to thread that onto our largest doll needle, straight through there. You can also use boot button eyes for this design. That will work really well, or even just a shanked button. So now I've got that on my needle and I can take that needle straight through the hole that I've made and I'm not catching any of the fabric, I'm going directly through the hole. I'm going to bring my needle out at the back of the head right down low in the centre. Do make sure it's in the centre, it helps you tie them off evenly. So I'm going to pull that all the way through, I'm going to check that there's nothing twisted, nothing's caught up, and that little eye should pull right in. So what I do like to do also is tie a knot in this group of four because I want to be able to differentiate between the two eyes when I'm pulling them in. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to thread the other eye, which I've got already on its on its thread, I'm going to thread that through my large doll needle. Then I'm going to take that one straight through the other side and I'm going to bring it out through the same hole that I just came out of there. So it's a good idea to take your awl and just make that hole a bit bigger. And when you bring your needle through, make sure you're not catching any fabric, you're coming straight out the hole. Let me get that second one in place. So that has both those eyes threaded through, both coming out the same hole at the back, not catching any of that surface fabric because we're tying them off into the stuffing of the head, not the surface of the fabric. So I've tied one preliminary knot and you want to push right in with your thumbs and tighten that knot at the back. It's something you need to do in a really comfortable position and continue to keep up that tension and you want to knot that off at least about four times before you go ahead and snip those thread ends. You can pull on them, the groups of threads independently and you'll be able to see which eye you're pulling on to be able to sink them evenly. They do need to be sunk evenly and get them as deep as you can. Your head should be stuffed very firm so it can take that. Tie them off, knot it off about four times, snip those thread ends because once you do that, they will disappear into that hole in the head. And that has a beautiful face all done. And you can see that sinking those eyes nice and deep and adding a bit of color around them just gives your bear just the most beautiful, soulful look. You can see the shading I've done on the ears, again, giving it that little vintage look just don't overdo it. So the final step here on the face is I'm going to use some Artist Gel Heavy Gloss Medium. And this is the Artlia brand. It comes in many different brands, but it needs to be an artist quality gel medium in a gloss. So it's fantastic for popping over fabric of all sorts. You can use this. I use it on noses and I have done for years. Don't use any of those nasty nose gels that you can buy from some bear suppliers. Buy the artist quality medium and a pot will last you for years. Now all you need to do is use a nice soft flat brush and we're simply going to paint that. It, uh, don't be horrified at the white, it dries perfectly clear. You want to follow the line of the stitching. The beauty of doing this is not only does your bear's nose last for years, it gives it a lovely shine like an old fashioned waxed nose, but on top of that, it holds all your stitches in place. So it's just a win-win. But you see, I'm just working it in to those stitches. I won't go down here. I just do the nose itself, not the lip line. And really blend it in. A nice flat soft brush is best. 
I generally just do the one coat. I find that's enough. And I will let that dry completely. And then we will come back when that's dry and we will put this beautiful bear together. It's the most exciting part. We now have all of our bare parts and we're going to put this little one together. So we're going to start with the legs. So you've already made your joint spots in the body for your arms and legs. And of course you've got that opening at the top. So let's start with our first leg. Find my joint hole. Find that with my needle. that one through. We've got uh, the other pieces of our joint ready. You're going to make sure first of all that you really push all of that fabric down around that bolt. Slip this one in and on. And then we add our washer and our nut. I've got some super glue ready too. I'm just going to finger tighten this at the moment. And I'm going to first check that I've got nothing caught up in between those layers. The fabric is all sitting nice and flat. You should have a beautiful free spinning joint like that. And then we can tighten that up using whichever tool you have. Just using my Banner. You want to tighten those joints until you can just move them because they will slacken off over time once those discs start to compress your fabric but you do need a nice firm joint. So for me that's going to be about right and once we add the stuffing too that helps compress it all so it will just loosen up slightly. So then I will go in and I will add one drop of my super glue in there on the threads of the bolt. It stops that nut ever coming adrift. Then we're going to repeat with the other leg and we're going to do the same with the arms each side. Same thing, making sure you can just move that joint and then that uh, the tension will be perfect. So I'm going to get all the limbs put on, just a little bit of super glue, then I'm going to do the head. There you can see arms and legs all beautifully jointed into place and everything's lovely and balanced. So now we're going to add the head. So the head is put on in exactly the same way and you're just going to drop that bolt through, slightly longer bolt, pop him on his head. And we're going to add the other parts. So if you've never jointed a bear before and you've always thought, oh, that'd be so hard, you can see this is the easiest way to put a bear or a stuffed animal together. So once you have the jointing system down, check out my jointing videos and you'll be able to do it. It's super, super easy. You can't even compare uh, what it would mean to have to sew these limbs on and have them look as good as this. And also, if you are making these memory bears uh, for your business, you need this level of professionalism for your clients and for your finished product. So just tightening that one up and I'm just a little and just going to check that everything is pulled out. Now we obviously have some gathers around this neck with this neck joint. You should have the slight impression of a hump on the back but everything else should sit nice and clean. So you need to tighten this neck joint to where everything's compressed but you don't want that there's no mobility because the head is what you want to be the most poseable. But I don't want to see anything that is looks like these discs aren't clamped together. They must be clamped together nice and firm and you should be able to move the head with a little bit of force. So I'm going to tighten that up. Same thing, a drop of super glue 
and then we will get this little one filled. So that has my beautiful bear all put together and now we're going to go ahead and fill him. Now filling this bear, the way that you fill him in the body will depend on the overall look that you're going for. So the styling of this bear, the shape of this bear is much more traditional than my other memory bear. So this is more of a vintage look. It has a German style um, and it will with the limbs and the head shape and so on. So you really can make this one look, up, look like a little worn vintage bear. When you're filling this one, if you're going for that style, I would add some weight to the base and I would softly fill the center and make sure you always fill out up around the neck and shoulders to hold that head up. But that will give you a certain amount of slump and softness. Depending on the fabric that you're using, this fabric won't work that way. I'll need to fill this little bear out, which is, which is what I like. Um, but if you're working with a fabric like a linen or something like that, that gives you some beautiful natural creasing, you can certainly softly fill it. Do a combination of weight and polyester filling and you'll get a nice squashy, a little slump look that still has the support. So just remember there's options there or you can pack it firm. But the one thing that I keep seeing that I'm going to stress again, when you fill this little bear, he should sit comfortably. I'll do a different camera angle when he's filled. He should sit comfortably, which means that his little arms should sit, sit next to his thighs beautifully. If you overstuff the body underneath, directly underneath the arms here, those arms will sit out. They'll poke straight out like this and it's not in any way an attractive look. So you need to have that underneath the air, underneath his arm area more relaxed so those little arms have room to sit down. So I'm adding a little bit of weight to mine. I'm just using not a large amount this time, but it's just, I've got some clean raw rice. I've added a little silica gel um, package in there. It just is a moisture absorber, just in case of any moisture getting into my rice. But certainly I usually use aquarium gravel. I'm all out, so that's why I'm using this. Um, I live in a climate where we're not going to get that moisture. Um, so I'm not concerned about that. But a little silica gel packet is a good thing to pop inside your bears generally because it absorbs any moisture. You get them with when you purchase all sorts of packaged goods. So I'm going to start by adding, first of all, some polyester filling to the very base of my bear in through the back. And I'm going to pad that out around the joints. And once I have that filled, I'm then going to just slip that parcel in there. It's just done up in two layers of stocking. So then I will fill the rest of my bear. Now go ahead and use your wool felting needle again once you get filled to the back and you've got it all packed in because we want it to be similar to when we close the openings on the arms and legs where there's just enough room to be able to do that. So I'm going to get him to that point and show you how he should look. So there we go, that has my little bear filled. Now you can see there, arms are sitting nice and comfortable. We've got some softness through the center section here. It's firm down below and firm up around to hold up that head. So now we're going to go ahead and close that opening. Remember that softness through the body there is also quite necessary if you are making this as a child's memory bear and they're going to be cuddling it. The softness through the body will be lovely and, it's, and the firmness of the arms and the legs and the head, just it gives it a lovely feel. They don't need to, you don't need all the limbs to be soft as well. It's just that body section. So now let's go ahead and close that opening. So the procedure is exactly the same as closing the opening on the arms and legs. Um, I've got my single strand of extra strong thread. I've got a whole big pile of knots in the end and I'm just going to come in. I've got to turn it to me to see this here. I'm going to bring my needle up again at the four millimeter seam allowance right where that seam starts to open out. I'm just using my ordinary needle for now. That knot will hold. We travel across, straight across into the other side and then just travel down the length of one stitch. 
So that's your first pull in stitch. Then we're going to come back to this side. We're going to dive in that first starting hole and travel down an equal amount down the other side. Now you can continue with this needle. Depends on how well your how firm your bear is stuffed through that body. But if you find it a bit tricky closing that back opening, you can always switch to a curved needle, which is really, really handy because it does just help you tuck in and out with those stitches. I'm feeling like this is going to be fine with my regular needle. So I've crossed over again, I've gone back to the opposite side. And as when you close your openings on your arms and legs, you always give that seam a squeeze and a pull in. You see how it relaxes, but it's got memory and it will pull in beautifully, but you must do that with every stitch. Like I always say, if you get, if you just sew away and you get down to here and all your stitches are slack and you think you're going to pull on that thread and it's all going to knit together, it really doesn't. So give it a good squeeze and pull it in each time. Remember to be very mindful of keeping these stitches the same each side so that you're traveling down the same and you won't end up with any puckering at the bottom. So it's continue down until that opening is completely closed. So our final step with our bear is we're going to add the ears, uh, often a daunting task for many. These ears are actually really easy to sew on um, for a number of reasons. And of course that again will depend on the fabric that you're using. Mine being a lovely soft wool, um, it's very easy for my needle to pass through. So first of all, you're going to need a medium fine doll needle. So that's easiest. Um, and I'm going to show you the easiest way to actually sew them on. But the key part of great ears on a bear is the positioning. So what we're going to do, this one's in the right position. Now to get that beautiful vintage look, we need to take a pin through that first front corner, take it straight through. The look we're going for is quite a tight curl and coming together at the front. So part of putting this centre top seam in for you, not only has given you some nice rise to the top of the head, it gives you a great marker spot for where your ears sit. So from the seam line down, I'm looking at that and it's probably almost two centimetres down the starting point. You want to check both sides. You want to look at your bear from every angle, matching it up at the top. And then we're going to pull that ear right back, right back here. And we're going to curl it around and bring that lower edge in. We're going to put a pin through the same on the underside. So we've got that really good bend in the ear. Now this one's pulled up further and back. So I can take that one back a little and higher up and again I'll check my position that needs to go up tighter it's really not much distance between those two pieces there once you have it in the right position then you want to go ahead and pin right the way around so that this is all supported while you're sewing it and you always pin them both on at the same time and get them even because during the sewing process when you finish sewing the first one on you'll look at the other one and think oh that's wrong they don't match now it will when you sew it on <laughs> it will look a little different once one's sewn on so just remember that don't panic when that happens but you do want to look at your bear from every angle and make sure that you've got them even so you see what I mean about this look, the very, very cupped look, that ear goes way back. I put my thumbs right in there and block his ears. And that's the look we're going for. If you were to take this ear and add it to the head like this, it's a completely different bear. And in my opinion, not very attractive and certainly not that beautiful German styling. So 
Very, very important where you put those ears. So I'm going to get this second one pinned all into place where it should be. I need to be looking directly at it to do that. So I'm pretty happy with that ear positioning now. We're going to go ahead and begin to sew those ears on. So I've got my needle. I've got a super long strand of extra strong thread with a strong knot at the end. And I'm just going to dive in at the back of the head here and I'm going to bring my needle out at my first pin point. Right where my pin is going through. That's where I want to come out. Pull that one through. At the back here, we've got that knot and we don't want it to sit on the surface. So I'm just going to enlarge that entry hole just a little with my awl. So I can pop that knot into the head, which it has done. So that's all quite invisible now. That knot will pull to the surface here. So now I'm going to dive into this ear. Take up some of the fabric on the underneath of this ear. And I'm going to take my needle. You need to be in a really good position for doing this. It certainly shouldn't be filming it on camera. But I'm going to take my needle and I'm going to come out at the base of the ear. So in the same situation, we're coming out through the head and coming out at the base of the ear where this pin is. So it can take a bit of manipulation and I'll need to move the bear to do it. So now my needle is coming out, it's gone through the head and now it's coming out at the base of the ear. Pull that thread through. And that's going to pull down. You see that's pulling down the front of the ear. And now we're going to go along to the bell. Pop it through the ear. And I'm going to go back up to where I started again. Come up. and pull that through, that will anchor the base. You'll see when I pull that in, it pulls in the corner of that ear. And then I'm gonna repeat that process, taking up a little bit of the underside of the ear and go back and forth at least three times. And then the front most important parts of the ear are anchored in place. So my thread is now coming out just a little further along that ear curve on the top. And I can now take my needle, I can dive in there, just take up some of the ear and travel across to the base again, but just a bit further along on that ear curve. So it's the same process all the way. You're gonna make your way back and forth around that whole ear curve until that whole base of that ear is attached to the head. It's absolutely the best way to sew ears on because you're sewing it into the stuffing. So you can see already that it's really making that ear pull in to be part of that head rather than just precariously hinged onto the surface of the fabric at the top. And when you sew ears on this way, little kids can carry bear around by the ears and they're never gonna come off. So. And, and it does, it just gives it that real sculpted look. So just go ahead and you make your way. You can go back and forth. You can come back this way, back this way. It doesn't matter the process. It just matters that every single section is attached to the head. And remember this back section here, this is what will hold your ear upright. So make sure that's firmly anchored. So I'm gonna get them both sewn into place. My little bear is now complete and you can see that ear set absolutely beautiful. We are now ready to do the final touches, which is just accessorizing your bear. So in most cases, this will be a memory bear put together in much the same way, quite naked with all sorts of bits of embellishments. Let me show you a couple of ideas for embellishing your bear in the end. You may just be making this bear for yourself, not as a memory bear. Um, and it's best to put something around a bear's neck. It does just soften, up that, soften off that neckline there. 
So what I've created is just a beautiful, simple bow in a chair bow style there, ribbon around the, the center, and I will tie that, tie that on at the side. And keeping to that color scheme with that blue and cream, I've also created a little resin pendant, which is made out of a little wood piece, a little wood tag, and I've added a picture from an old storybook, and that is from Jane Hissey's books. That's Little Bear. And a little bit of text from an old vintage um, dictionary that says happy, and it's the definition of happy. This little bear I'm calling happy. And it's just such a sweet little finish. I've just vintage the edges there, add some beautiful twine that works. I do have a video that shows you how to work with resin and make little tags like this. So you can check that video out, but that's going to be perfectly suited. And then I have a beautiful old vintage key. Mr. P Mr. T picks them up for me every now and then. And put some gorgeous velvet antique ribbon on it. And I've just wrapped the stem of that key with some pearl thread to match my project and painted it with that same gloss that I used on the nose and it finishes it off beautifully. So I'm gonna get all of these bits and pieces popped on my bear and show you the finished result. So here's my little sweetheart in all her finery and I think you'll agree a beautiful new memory bear for us all to put together. Just a lovely balanced bear, very easily put together and just so much room for embellishment. And that's the beauty of this shape here and a really great size too. So lots of room to add all sorts of bits and pieces. When people are making memory bears, they get given all sorts of scraps and little things and you can really personalize it. That little neck dressing just absolutely makes it. So now we've got our two, you will probably remember my original memory bear. So you can see the size difference there. Definitely a more modern style and that more antique style. And I think it's gonna give you a really great basis to make some incredible bears for people. Now, let me give you one more tip, my final tip. The way that I have my bear sitting is that I have him, her in a very relaxed position, arms down. I've turned him or her three quarters, then tilt and turn that head back to look at the camera. That there is your money shot. When you're taking a photograph of your bear, the last thing you do is line everything up and have the bear looking at you straight on. You must offset them, three quarter turn and turn that head back to look at you and look at that. Just beautiful because remember when you are selling bears, it's often just your photographs um, that are gonna make the sale. So you've gotta make it as good as it can possibly be. So I hope you've enjoyed this one. I know so many of you are going to absolutely jump on this and you know what? It's just a beautiful bear just to make for your own collection. So thanks for joining me. So I have had the best week in my new studio here designing that little one for you. And I really hope you make the most of it. I can't tell you how excited I am to see some of these made up. So come and join our Facebook page where you can share any of your Lisa Pay creations, masterclass or pay it forward. You can show off your work there to all of us. Great big community there. And we love to see what you're doing. And I'm really excited to see some fantastic beautiful bears come up this week. You can also chat to me on Instagram one-on-one -on -one, and you will be able to talk to me about anything. If there's something you really want to show me and I haven't seen it on the Facebook page, put it right under my nose there. I will definitely see it on Instagram. Anything you want to ask me privately, go right ahead and join me there. That address is across your screen as well. So I'm getting used to my new surroundings here. I have to say, I'm definitely getting more exercise because not everything's in arm's reach anymore. I've got to trot across the studio a lot. So that's probably a good thing. I'll take it as a bonus. So look, I'm going to be giving you, on Pay It Forward particularly, a lot more little projects that there are, there are things that I would do for myself 
create for myself maybe their fashion, they can be textile jewellery, all sorts of little things that I would normally think, ah, oh, you know, maybe that's not sort of big enough, exciting enough. And then I realised that if I'm making it for me, there might be some of you out there who might just like that little idea. And sometimes it is just about seeing a little idea and then you can take that and run with it. So I'm gonna try and share everything that I do creatively with you all. So looking forward to that. Everybody stay safe, keep on being creative. And until next time, keep on paying all those good things forward. Till next time together, it's Huru from me.